friends, bring you greetings on this beautiful day, and praise God for the gift of this day, and for our time to be together in the Word. Hey, if you got your Bible with you today, we're going to join in to chapter 10, picking up at verse 1, and we have listened to the blowing of the trumpets of the first six angels, bringing forth that wrath, and now we have a little interlude again. Um, we've seen this once before, uh, we're going to see it again here, and let's just dig right in. It says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. So we have this opening, this dramatic image of this angel that has come down and planted one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, an image of absolute authority over these things. This, you know, We have this image of power. We have this image of a face like the sun and legs like fiery pillars. Uh, we, we have this, this absolute dominance or authority in which this one is coming down and delivering this part of the, the apocalyptic vision. And then he it talks about him giving a loud shout. And when he shouted, the voice of the seven thunders, God spoke from heaven. And I was about to write it down. So we, we don't know what this was. We still don't know what it was. John was told not to write it down, not to share it with us. Um, why? why? Why write this down to say I was about to write this, but then I was told not to write this. Um, it's an interesting thing, but I, I think it points us toward... Uh, everything I've read and studied on this, that it points us toward that this revelation is indeed under the authorship of God. Um, but this is also a message to John, that John may be fully inside the vision and that he's charged to go and prophesy this message. And we're going to see that as we press on in the chapter here. It says, Then the angel that I had seen standing in the sea and on the land raised his right hand to the heavens. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay, but the days when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, or the, when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So this is a proclamation that the mystery of God, the mystery of salvation, the mystery of God's purpose in humanity we can trace that purpose all the way back to the Garden of Eden, in which Adam and Eve violated, they sinned against God, and we have continued in that path of sin all the way to today, and all the way to the point of the revelation here. And now there is God proclaiming that, okay, the completion of my plan, of redeeming my people, of calling for myself a, a people and a nation, and then calling to myself all those who would put them, uh, their, their trust in the blood of the Lamb. Um, that there's, there's a completion here because now this is talking about the end of times, the wrath of God, the proclamation uh, of the final reign of the Lamb. We, we have all this image coming to completion here, and there's going to be no more delay. No more delay for the martyrs, no more delay for those, those who walk upon the earth and walk faithfully in God. This is the culmination point where all everything comes to completion and the fullness of redemption in every life is realized every life who, who puts their trust in the lamb it says then i heard the voice sorry, then the voice that i had heard from heaven spoke to me once more go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing in the sea and on the land and so i went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll and he said to me take it and eat it it will turn your stomach sour but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So we have this image of the little scroll, and there has been a plethora of debate on what was on the little scroll. What we, The only thing we know about it is that John was called to eat it. In other words, not just to, to read this for information, but it's an image of, of internalizing it. 
and it, it's not it's not symbolic. I mean, John is told to eat this scroll. And then there's this description of, he says, as you eat this, it will be like, it will be like, tastes like honey in your mouth, but it will turn bitter and sour in your stomach. Um, some of the images that we have about the little scroll are that they, they indeed are about the culmination of God's redemptive, redemptive purpose in humanity. And there's a, there's a sweetness to that. There's a sweetness to everyone who has put their trust in Christ. And so yes, in our, in our mouth, there, there is that deep sweetness, but as we swallow it and it goes to our stomach, is there a bitterness as we begin to see the fullness of the, the completion of, of God's work in human history or the completion of God's redemptive purpose as we see the results of those who have not put their trust. That's one speculation on what the little scroll is. Um, again, there, there's great debate amongst commentators, uh, those who have studied this and studied this, and we, we don't know. John knows, I mean, he, he was there, he was you know in the presence of God. Um, what we do know is that John is called to go and prophesy. And we, we see it in the end there, it says, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So we, we have this little scroll that then it becomes part of the, the, the foundation for John being called to go and prophesy. Go and bring warning against the people that if they do not turn from their wicked ways, then you know the, they, they will not see the kingdom of heaven. They will not know the rewards of the kingdom of heaven. And this is, this is something that it relates back to the seven churches, but no doubt this relates to everybody on the face of the earth. John is called to raise up a prophecy. Um, what we, what I would say most commentators agree on is that the, the little scroll uh, becomes part of the, the driving force for prophesying. So that's why so many commentators get into the idea that in the mouth it's, it's very sweet that the God's redemptive purposes in humanity are coming to fulfillment. Um, that, that is a sweet taste. It's certainly a sweet taste for the martyrs. It's a sweet taste to all those who are in Christ. But then as we swallow it and the, the fullness of that sets in, we look at many who are not in Christ and the calamities that will befall them, the suffering that will befall them, and the ultimate uh, destination of their life, that, that they will endure, that they will not know the kingdom of heaven, that, that that turns to a deep bitterness. That is why so many commentators lean in that direction, that then that becomes the foundation or the motivation uh, you know, to, to live out the call that has been placed on John's life to go and spend his time prophesying that many might turn to God still and put their trust in the Lamb. All right, friends, well, we have had the interlude, and next we're going to move on to chapter 11, where, again, we we have a little, uh, little more of the interlude time. So uh, look forward to being with you tomorrow. Uh, let's go forth this day. Let us remember that we indeed are are those who put the, their trust in the blood of the Lamb. Let that not just be a, an action at one point in our life. Let that not just be a, a mental thought that we have, but to let that be the commitment of our life where we are wholly devoted to the Lamb and whatever He purposes us for, whatever He calls us to, like John, we are faithful to go and proclaim it to others that they too may know the victory that is in the, in, in the Lamb of God. Praise be to God. Friends, go forth this day. Know always that God loves you. I know the last few days I, I have ended with that, and I, and I used to always say, so do I. Um, I do love you, but my love for you is, is not possible in terms of being at the level of God's love. And, and I started to struggle with that, to say God loves you, and so do I. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I know that the love that I have for you is something that's sourced from the love that God has poured into my heart. But my love is so fractionary compared to the fullness of his love. And so that, that's kind of what went on with that. Um, do always know that I love you. And I want you to know more than anything that God loves you. God bless.